hopefully works. Okay, perfect. Great, so with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Annalise Kaiser from the University of Michigan. And she'll be telling us, uh, giving us an introduction to configuration spaces and grade groups. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, um, so I'm Annalise. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, you, you can follow me on Twitter if, since the, I guess that's where this seminar kind of sprung out of. Um, I just finished my master's at the University of Michigan and I'm starting my PhD in the fall. And this is kind of um, a talk meant for a pretty general audience um, about um, what I studied during my master's. Um, and that's something I did um, under the supervision of Dr. Jenny Wilson um, at U of M. Um, full disclosure, I have had a little bit of a weird health week, so like I'm not at the top of my game, but you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna go with it. Um, all right, so let's talk about what the, the kind of goals are. Or, nope, that's not what I had next. See, already off to a great start. All right, a little bit of motivation. Um, so braid groups are an object that were um, first described in terms of configuration spaces, which are much older objects in 1891. And they were formally introduced by um, Artin in the 20s. So they're sometimes called Artin's braid groups. Um, and both configuration spaces and braid groups have a really, really broad range of applications um, that you can um, do. I, I looked into a couple of these for my thesis research, although I can't say that I could explain every word that's up on the slide right now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, that most exciting one, probably, which is robot motion planning at the end. Okay. Um, and yes. All right. So we're going to start out by um, talking about, um, all right, so I just said we have braid groups and configuration spaces. We're going to start out just by talking about what are, what are braid groups and trying to get um, a feel for that. Ah, here's my little slide. Yes, we will define the braid groups. We'll define configuration spaces. And then um, I'm going to describe the relationships between the two. So these actually are very um, deeply related objects, um, but it's not obvious um, at, first, at first glance why that's so. And so I'll try to give a, a good justification for that. Um, and then, yeah. So, all right. What are the braid groups? Um, we're going to be talking about both the braid group and the pure braid group. So we'll start with the braid group, um, which in my talk I'm going to write as B sub n. Um, there are many different ways you can denote the braid group um, depending on whose books you read. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the braid group on n strands. Okay, and well, all right, so this is a group um, and its objects are braids. And so what does a braid look like? Um, it's going to be a collection of strands that cross over each other. And the important thing about these about these braids is the kind of combinatorial information it's telling us about what strand crosses over what and when. Okay, so here I've got a braid on six strands, right? So I have these six vertical strands. And I'm going to read my braids from top to bottom, and I'm going to number the strands from left to right. Okay, so for example, this red strand starts as the first strand and ends as the second. And this blue strand starts as the sixth strand and ends as the fourth. Okay, so um, if you've ever, you know, braided someone's hair, you've made a friendship bracelet, um, you, you, you're on the right track, right? That's what you should be thinking about when you think of a braid. Okay. Um, so, right, so I've got my six strands, and then let's just kind of break down the information this braid is giving us. So the first thing that happens in this braid, is, because again, I read from top to bottom, is my second strand crosses over my first strand. Okay, that's the first piece of information it tells me. Then my um, fifth strand crosses over my sixth strand. Okay. My third strand crosses over my fourth strand. And my fourth strand crosses over my fifth strand. Okay, so in a little bit, we'll talk about um, how, to, how to write that down um, in, this, in this notation I'm using down here. But this is again just an idea. This is the information my braid is telling me. It's very combinatorial in nature. Okay. Um, so two braids are going to be equivalent if we can continuously deform one braid into the other without shifting the ends of the strands. Okay, so these two braids on the screen right now are equivalent. Um, and I've color coded the strands just to make it easier to see. All right, so what this first braid is telling me is that I'm crossing my second strand over my first third strand. And over here on the right, 
this braid, um, you know, it's much longer, it looks more complicated. But if I imagine if I just had strings on a piece of table, right, I can take that, um, this top part of this blue strand and just pull that to the right. And I can kind of pull the red strand to the left and just kind of separate those there. So that really all of the cro um, crossings that are happening, if I just kind of pull those together a little bit, is I have my red strand crossing over my blue strand. Okay, so if I can pin down the ends of the strands and I can um, continuously deform one braid into another, um, and the order they cross over each other does, does matter, um, then two braids are equivalent. Okay. Um, I realize I speak a little fast, so I'll pause just for a moment here. All right, so um, I said that this is a braid group, all right? So we've talked about what the objects are, so let's talk about what the group operation is. And that's going to be concatenation. Okay, um, so um, here I'm going to take, um, if I want to take, um, if I have a braid alpha and a braid beta, all right, and I want to know what alpha beta is, um, if I apply the, the operation um, with the two of them, um, the way that I would come up with this new braid is I'm going to take the bottom of my braid alpha, okay, and I'm going to glue the top of my braid beta to it. Okay, so I'm taking, um, um, did I make pictures? No, I did not. Um, so I'm gonna take the bottom of alpha and glue the top of beta to it, right? So I can see right here, hopefully you can see my cursor is kind of that split, right? So first I do what alpha tells me to do, which is to take the second over the third, then the second over the third again. And then I do what beta tells me to do, which is first over second, and then third over second. Okay. All right, so I've got these braids. Um, I can concatenate them and um, I know when they're equivalent. Um, and so let's talk about kind of how we could write this down. So you can give a presentation for the braid group. If you don't know what a group presentation is, that's okay. Um, but the braid group, um, we can write down a list of generators for it. Okay, and so um, what it means to write down a list of generators is that I can come up with um, some braids where I can build any other braid um, out of either a combination of generators or inverses, right? So here my generators are going to be, my generator um, sigma one would be crossing the second strand over the first strand um, and sigma one inverse would be doing the reverse, okay? So it would be crossing the um, first strand over the second. So here's an example. Um, sigma two inverse, okay, so this involves the third and the second strands, and this one is going to be where the second strand crosses over the third strand. Um, again, this is a thing where convention on how you label your generators um, varies from person to person, so apologies if this doesn't match up with something you've seen before. They, they mean the same thing, but just worded a little bit different. Um, and so I can see, right, if I've got a much longer braid, um, I can break it down into its generators, right? So in this braid, I take my second strand and I cross it over the first, that's what sigma one does. Then I take my third strand, cross it over the second, that's sigma two right there. And then I take my second strand, cross it over the first, that's sigma one again. Okay. So I can build um, any braid out of these generators and their inverses. Um, and um, there are also relations on the braid group, so you can give a, a nice group presentation. Um, so if you are a group theorist, maybe that's something you're interested in. Um, so the first relation is that um, two um, generators commute if and only if they're sufficiently far apart, right? So if I have, um, if I have sigma one and sigma three, that's saying sigma one says, I take my second strand, I cross it over my first. Sigma three says I take my fourth strand, I cross over my third, right? They're not really involving the same strands. Um, you can, you can um, separate them. So sigma one, sigma three is the same braid as sigma three, sigma one. Okay, so I can picture um, taking the second strand here and kind of pulling it down a little bit, taking this fourth strand here, pulling it up a little bit on my screen, and I would have the same braid as I have on the right. Okay, um, so that's one of the sets of relations I have. The other one um, is a little bit longer. Um, so this one says um, here, for example, that sigma one, sigma two, sigma one is the same thing as sigma two, sigma one, sigma two. Okay, so let's take a moment and see what that means. So sigma one says, take my second strand over my first. 
sigma two says take my third strand over my second and then take my second over my first. Um, and really kind of what this is doing to my braid is it's kind of taking this um, third strand and making it end up in the first position. Okay, um, and then taking this first one and crossing it over. Um, but notice that if I take this blue strand here, right, and I just kind of deform it upwards on my screen to maybe over here, and I take this red strand, I just kind of pull it to the right. Um, again, because of the way these strands are laying on top of each other, these two are equivalent braids. Um, and it turns out that um, those relations are all you need to give a presentation for the braid group. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the braid group. Um, I've got these strands, I cross them over each other. Um, I can do my operations by concatenating. So the pure braid group um, is, is a subgroup of the braid group, okay? And it's the subgroup where all of the strands end in the order they started in, okay? So, um, you know, this is an element of the braid group um, that, that I think we were just looking at earlier, right? And I can see that um, the first strand ends in the third place, the second strand ends in the second place, the third strand ends in the first place, right? So I can see that I'm permuting the order of my strands. Whereas if I don't permute the order of my strands, if I have a braid where each strand, and again, they're color coded to make this easier to see, if I have a braid where um, each strand ends in the order that they started in, that's going to be an element of the pure braid group. Okay, um, so that's a big difference between the pure braid group and the braid group. Um, pure braid group means strands and where they started. Um, you can also give a presentation for the pure braid group, although it's um, much, much messier. And so we're not really going to dwell on it. Um, but again, if you're a group theorist, um, you probably care that at least the fact that we can give a presentation. Um, so here our generators are a little more complicated um, because again, we need our braids to our strengths to end where they start. So our old generators no longer work. Um, so now we kind of need these generators that um, kind of cross, like twist two strands together and then put them back where they started, right? So um, we have these slightly more complicated generators. Um, and if you're, um, and it's, these are a little annoying to write in terms of um, the generators for the braid group, um, especially when you have a braid group with lots and lots of strands. Um, and again, as I said, there are relations, um, they're very messy. Um, they're kind of a pain to work through. Although I promise if you wanted, you could sit down and you could kind of take some strings and you could play with this and you would see that, oh yeah, I believe that this is true. Um, although I um, would be, I would not be able to tell you that these are the only relations that would be too hard for me. So it's um, not, a, not an easy problem to show. Okay, um, so, that's the pure braid group. So then let's talk a little bit about um, a new type of object, configuration spaces. All right, um, again, I'm gonna talk about two types of configuration spaces. So I'm gonna talk about an ordered and unordered configuration space. Okay, um, I'm gonna denote the ordered configuration space on endpoints of a space X as comp sub N of X. And I'm going to denote the unordered configuration space on endpoints of X as the same, but with a bar over top, okay? Again, there are actually a lot of different conventions and um, I, I don't think this is the most common, but it's the one that I use. Okay. So you may see these named very differently. Um, all right, so let's start with the ordered configuration space and let's talk about what the definition for this is. So um, if I have the ordered configuration space on endpoints of a space X, what I'm doing is I'm taking um, X to the N. Okay, so I'm taking um, tuples of points in X, but I don't want my tuples to repeat the same um, value ever. Okay, so um, if, the, um, if, if I have two things in my tuple, they can't be the same. So let me write a brief, example let's see yes here we go so for example um one two minus one is in the configuration space on and on three points of r okay um but one two one would not be in this configuration space 
Okay, and again, it's because I um, now I'm repeating one of my coordinates. My two. Okay. Um, and topologically, I'm going to give this the subspace topology. So I really am. I'm taking a, um, x to the n, and I'm taking the subspace where I'm excluding um, these. Um, you can you can refer to this as the kind of the heavy diagonal is what you're excluding, or maybe the fat diagonal. Um, I just like to call it the heavy diagonal. But okay. So that's what the definition is. Um, and um, I'm going to refer to a whole tuple as a point in configuration space. And each of the um, little pieces of that tuple I'll refer to as a particle, right? So particles are points in my original space, but I need several of them to come up with a point in my configuration space. So these are the words I'm gonna use just to try and um, keep it clear what I'm referring to. Okay, so a point in configuration space is going to be made up of particles. All right. Um, so let's think about visualizing this. Um, so one way of visualizing this, if I wanted to think about the configuration space on two points of, um, for example, the fill line, um, is I can literally take um, R2, right? I'm, and I want to look at the subspace where X1 and X2 are not equal, right? So I'm just taking R2 and I'm cutting out this diagonal, right? Um, and so then if I wanted to represent a point in the um, configuration space, I can just plot it um, kind of in, in a way that we're used to. Um, but this quickly becomes um, not very feasible, right? If I wanted to look at four points in R, um, I don't know about you, I can't visualize four-dimensional space. Um, so that doesn't really work very well. Um, so um, when we're working with kind of more dimensions, um, another way of doing this is instead of take, looking at R squared, I'm just going to like draw out my real line and I'm going to label each particle um, in there. Okay, so I'm going to mark where um, the particle the particle one is, and I'm going to mark where particle two is, and I'm going to distinguish between those. And if I, want to, and if I wanted to represent multiple points, um, I would just need to make sure that I have, um, that I'm labeling them all very clearly. Okay, so this method, um, works a little better for um, things with more high dimensions. I'm going to use both of these for some examples in this presentation, but I'll try to be clear which one I'm using when. OK. Um, all right, so two different ways that I can think about my configuration space. Um, then let's talk about the unordered configuration space of endpoints. OK, so the unordered configuration space of endpoints, um, it's a quotient space. So I take my ordered configuration space and I quotient by um, the action of the symmetric group. Um, and realistically, what that means is that if I have x1, or here, let's be a little more explicit. Let's have, um, let's have 1, 2, minus 1, right? This is in um, comp 3 of R, OK? And another point in comp 3 of R, I could have 1, minus 1, 2. Right, and these are different points. Okay, but um, under the action of the symmetric group, they are going to be the same. So they're going to be equivalent um, in my unordered configuration space. So um, quite literally, what I'm doing is I'm forgetting the order of my points. Right. Um, so we could also write this. Um, I think some people use this as a convention for writing unordered points. I could write the point as for example, minus one, one, two, um, using brackets. Okay, so unordered configuration space, I'm quotienting by the action of the symmetric group. I'm gonna forget the order of all of my particles. Ooh, I think I said order of points a few times there. That was bad. I should have said we forget the order of our particles. Okay, all right. So um, let's look at a couple examples, right, of maybe the interval. That's a nice, very tidy space that um, is easy for me to think about. Right, so um, if I want to look at the ordered configuration space on two points of the interval, um, then I'm just looking at um, tuples in the interval where um, the two coordinates are not the same. Right, so this is very similar to the example we did with the real line. Um, and here I'm using kind of that first method of visualization where I'm looking at i, i squared. Okay, and so I have the unit square where I'm excluding the diagonal. Um, for the unordered configuration space, I'm now identifying the points x, y, and y, x. Okay, so that's actually going to be identifying points across this diagonal. And um, it's going to be equivalent to taking just one of the two triangles we had before. Okay, so um, just to be clear, 
um, ordered configuration space, we have kind of these two connected components. Um, unordered configuration space, we now only have one of them um, because we've forgotten a bunch of our points. We've, um, we've said that they're going to be equivalent. Okay. Um, let's look at a little more fun visualization. So what if I want to think about um, three dimensions? It's about the biggest that my brain can do. Um, so here, if I look at um, the ordered configuration on three points of the interval, now I'm thinking about the unit cube, but I'm removing three planes, right? I want to remove the planes x equals y, y equals z, and x equals z. Okay, so my, um, my configuration space is, is, again, it's this cube with these planes cut through it. Um, and if I want to think about like what that kind of looks like, I can actually pull it apart and there's going to be six different connected components um, here. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the ordered configuration space on three points of the interval. And it turns out that if I want to think about unordered configuration space on three points, um, again, when I um, take that equivalence relation, I'm going to end up with only one of my connected components. Okay, so this is a very... Um, cute thing about um, when you're looking at configurations of the interval, um, when you quotient by your symmetric group, you end up with just one of your connected components. Okay, so here I've arbitrarily chosen one to shade in. Great. Okay. Um, I would also like to say I did not choose one to shade in. I made someone else make this picture for me. I cannot make pictures this good. Um, so my partner Owen made, me, made these for me and I'm very, very grateful to them. Um, I believe they did it using Blender, if anyone is curious about how to make very nice 3D images. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about this configuration space, these braid groups. Um, and, you know, I kind of get that like braid groups have a bunch of strands and configuration spaces have a bunch of particles, but like it's not really immediately obvious why I would be talking about these two things at the same time. And it turns out that the pure braid group is the fundamental group of the um, ordered configuration space of the plane. And the braid group is a fundamental group of the unordered configuration space of the plane. Okay, um, if you're familiar with the term fundamental group, you, you might be kind of trying to roll that through your head right now. If you don't know what the word fundamental group means, that's actually okay. Um, very imprecisely, um, please don't nitpick me on this definition. What this means is that if I have a loop, in my um, configuration, order configuration space um, of the plane that corresponds to a braid in the pure braid group. And if I can continuously deform one loop into the other, then the braids represented are the same. Okay, so loops in configuration space of the plane correspond to braids. Um, um, and when it's the the ordered configuration space corresponds to the pure braid group. The unordered configuration space corresponds to the braid group. All right, this is all just words. Um, so let's look at an example. So we're going to think about a loop in um, just to, to um, here we're going to do configuration space on four points of R2. Okay, so here um, again, I can't visualize four dimensional space. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking slices of the plane, right, and I'm putting um, time is zero at the top and time is one at the bottom. And I'm just taking four slices here. And I've got um, these, these, order, these points in my order configuration space. So I can see I've labeled four particles as black, red, blue, and green. Um, I realize actually that's not very color vision friendly. So um, later I will connect them. But um, just so you know, there, there are four labeled points there. OK. Um, and so what a loop in this configuration space is, right, is it's, I have these particles, they're moving around. At no point do two particles occupy the same space, right? So um, let's go ahead and kind of fill in what this loop looks like, okay? And here what I'm doing is um, I'm kind of drawing in the path that each particle takes. And as the observer, I'm, going, I'm kind of observing from this, um, um, I'm observing along the XT plane, and when um, two strands cross over each other, what that means is that two particles have the same X value at the same time, but they can't have the same Y value, right? Because two particles can't be the same. And so whichever Y value is um, smaller, so whichever particle is closer to me, I'm going to denote that as crossing over um, the other particle. Okay, so I'm trying to, um, I, I am the observer, I'm looking at the XT plane, and I'm looking at um, this loop and how these particles move, and I'm kind of, you know, tracing the lines that they follow, and um, 
labeling these crossings like so. And now that I've done that, um, this is starting to look an awful lot like a braid, right? So if I if I really take that, I'm going to take out the kind of the planes and everything that that extra stuff. Um, this on the left, this is a braid, right? This is a pure braid on four strands. Um, you know, if if the way that I drew it out earlier is like nicer for you, you can think about it in this way, right? Because this is encoding the information of a braid, right? It tells me that um, my fourth particle goes over my third and my second goes over my first and so on. Um, okay, so this is um, this is kind of a visualization of how a loop and configuration space really does correspond to um, a braid. Um, and so the reason that ordered configuration space corresponds with pure braid group is that if I think about um, a, a loop, um, for this to be a loop and not just a path, I want to end at the same point I start with. And in ordered configuration space, that means that each particle needs to end where they started out. Okay, so that corresponds to um, this idea of the pure braid group. When I'm thinking about um, unordered configuration space, now this point um, is the same as this point, even though my particles are permuting themselves. Okay, so in order, unordered configuration space, I can permute my particles along that loop. Um, and so that allows me to get braids that are actually in the um, braid group, not just the pure braid group. Okay, so I can see here, right, if I do the same thing with a different loop, but now in unordered configuration space, I can end up with a, a braid um, in the braid group, not just the pure group. Okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of the big thing I want to get across was just like, here's this thing called braid, here's this thing called a configuration space, and here's this really cool way they're related. Um, and it turns out that um, um, it's, it's um, configuration spaces of, if you look at R or if you look at um, um, like R cubed or higher dimensions, they don't really have um, very nice braiding. Um, it turns out that if you look at particles on the real line, they can't really cross over each other if you look at a loop, right? They, they can't ever um, pass by. And if you think about particles moving um, in, in 3D space, um, any braids you can actually just unwind. So um, there's actually not um, interesting braiding, at least in the context of loops um, in, in higher dimensional space. So um, it's really cool that like the configuration spaces of this plane correspond to this completely other, very combinatorial, very um, algebraic thing. Um, so one application, just because it's um, it's fun to describe, it's like what whenever someone's like, "What math do you do?" and I'm like, "Oh, I do this." It's like really cool, and they're like, "Okay, but like, what it what's it for?" Um, thankfully, I've come up with a very succinct answer to give them that is usually fairly satisfying. So say um, I, um, I work for Amazon, I'm a capitalist, and I've replaced all my workers with robots. And I want to, um, um, I have these tracks on the floor that I want my robots to take. Um, and I don't want them to bump into each other, right? So maybe, uh, maybe I've got like a station here, and a station here, and a station here, and a station here, station here, station here. And I've got these various tracks that go between my stations. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a graph right now, by the way. All right, so maybe I've got some, some different paths that my robots can take to get from station to station. And maybe I've got like three, three robots. So let's call this robot one, and I've got robot two, and I've got robot three. And I want them to make their deliveries along these paths, and I want them to move stuff between stations. Um, but it would be really bad if two robots bumped into each other. Right, that would, um, I just have these tracks. So if my robots bump into each other, that's quite bad. Um, and so if you want to think about all of the different um, paths that you can have your robots take, really what you're looking at is the configuration space of this graph. Um, and it doesn't have to be a graph, okay? So if I, if I didn't have a graph, if I just had a bunch of robots moving around in free space, um, that would be fine too, right? So again, my configuration space would be telling me all of, um, all of the different places that I can have my robots in. And then um, when I look at the, um, the fundamental group of this, of this graph, for example, it tells me all of the different um, loops I can have robots take. Okay. Um, this also means that like lots of the applications here, um, another thing is you could um, 
you could have maybe drones that are um, doing some things that I wouldn't support. Um, and so I don't actually do any of these applications. Um, but this is a nice like, you know, when you when you tell your aunt this, um, she understands what you're saying. Okay. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say for today. So just to again wrap up, we looked at the braid group, um, which were these um, strands where um, the strands don't have to end up in the same place they started. We looked at the pure braid group where strands do. And we looked at unordered and unordered configuration spaces, right? So these subspaces of X to the N um, where no particles can occupy the same space. And then we talked about how a loop in the configuration space of the plane corresponds to a brain diagram. Okay. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that um, my master's was funded and supported by the Marjorie Lee Brown Scholars Program, which is a master's program, um, a fully funded master's program at University of Michigan um, for students who tend to come from um, underrepresented or marginalized backgrounds. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about that program, um, feel free to let me know. Feel free to contact me about it. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. It's a really great opportunity for people who often don't get the chance to go to grad school in math. Um, and I'd like to thank my advisor, Jenny Wilson, um, who was tremendously supportive and honestly the, the best advisor I could ever, ever dream of. Um, and also thank you all for sitting here and listening and learning a little bit with me. Thank you very much, Annalise. Let's go ahead and uh, give a round of applause. And does anybody have any any questions? I realize one of my character flaws is that I speak too fast for someone to interrupt me during my presentation. So now is a great time to ask a question. I, I was kind of wondering about something a while back, um, like when you you had this sort of cube, right, with the planes in it, and when you when you took the quotient, like miraculously somehow you just kind of get one connected component out of that. Uh, is this is this like something that always happens when you do this go from unordered to ordered, or can you end up with like multiple components sometimes? Um, so I know that this is true for the interval in the real line. Um, I'm not sure whether it's necessarily true for other spaces. I haven't thought about that, which I really should. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that um, if you're on the nth configuration space, you have um, um, the number of um, connected co components you have corresponds to the number of um, elements in SN, right? So there are six permutations of three numbers and we have six connected components. And um, if you think about like points moving along an interval, like I have, a, or particles moving along an interval, um, what each connected component corresponds to is this idea, like if I have particle one, particle two, particle three on a line, particle one can't cross over particle two, right? They can slide back and forth, but if they, they can't bump into each other, like they can't cross over continuously um, because the point where they're at the same spot is not actually included in my configuration space. Um, so the reason there's like a different connected component for every element of um, SN is because they, they quite literally represent, okay, this is the order of my particles on the interval and here's how they're allowed to, um, to, to move. Um, so I don't actually know um, for other spaces, um, there's some really cool um, work that like, there's some really cool pictures of configuration spaces of graphs um, there's a really great um, senior thesis by an undergrad that I read that I highly recommend if you're interested in learning about configuration spaces, I can find it and send it um, to anyone interested. Um, but in that, the student um, looks at a bunch of configuration spaces of graphs, and I imagine that would be a good way to test like whether, um, I, think, I think they draw the ordered configuration spaces, but I imagine you could try to draw the unordered configuration space yourself and then look and see whether it um, matches up. Although actually now that I think about it, in these graphs, there was just one connect, in these configuration spaces of graphs, there was just one connected component. So actually definitively then I can say that this, this connected component to um, um, unordered configuration space kind of correspondence does not always hold.
Sorry, I think I interrupted someone also. Oh, I was just saying that if the original space was disconnected, surely you would not have only one connected component in the final um, unordered, right? If like the original space started disconnected. Yeah, I would I would believe that. That would be rude if you if you did end up. We should really just sit down and work out some more configuration spaces because they're so fun. Do you, do you happen to know if people look at these things? So it seems like the, the plane is kind of the most interesting sort of thing, but like if you just compactify to a sphere or something or like go on like a like a flat surface or something, do people look at these kinds kinds of things or? I, I believe so. Um, I have not, but I, I'm pretty sure that's something that people do. Um, I think my advisor looks at configuration spaces of just manifolds in general and kind of what you can say about that. Um, but I, I think configurations on the sphere are also, um, again, they have lots of real world applications, right? So they're, they're very fruitful things to study. Can I just I'd like a small comment just in answer to that question as well? Like the one thing, I don't know much about configuration spaces at all, but like I know one super cool example that I've come across is when you want to study a double pendulum, the like, and you want to, you can parameterize this by like two numbers, like how much the first thing's rotating, and how much the second one is. So like the configuration space of the torus is like the configuration space of the double pendulum. And I think it's true that like the bits where the numbers are the same correspond to equilibria. So like there's this fun link between like Morse theory and like homology and stuff and like mechanical bodies and systems. So it's that really is cool. so cool. It's so cool. I wish I knew more about it. I don't, but I just know it's a cool story. That it's like, yeah, it's me really too. Cool. Yeah. I'm so glad I came today so I could hear about that. Cause I, I put a big list of things that um, configuration spaces and braid groups are related to, but I don't actually know how they're related in all of these cases, only some of them. Where's my big list? Yeah, I claim that this is just a small subsection of the things that you can apply this to. Um, does my work, did my work ever run into braids on surfaces? Um, no, my, I've mostly been um, just kind of, um, so when I did my thesis, I was looking at braids more in a combinatorial group theory sense um, um, and thinking about, um, I thought a little bit about like um, orderability of braid groups, that kind of thing. Um, so I actually have not thought about braids on surfaces, but that's something I would love to learn more about. I'm kind of curious on on that side. There's this um, is it like this L space conjecture about like left orderability of of fundamental groups or something? Is this is this similar or do you know? Um, I don't know that. I do not know of that. But um, okay. okay. Yeah, if you send me a longer message, I might be able to look up whether that is is actually. Yeah, not off That's the top fair. of my head. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Thank you all so much for having me and to, to Zach for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Let's take a think on at least one more time. And I guess I'll stop the recording here. <laughs>